It is my pleasure and really my honor to welcome our keynote speaker and honor him with the National Wildlife Federation's J.N. Ding Darling Conservation Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. William McDonough. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life, it's a new life. Good evening. It's a real privilege to be here, and I'm going to tell some stories. I was born in Tokyo, Japan in 1951, and I remember as a three-year-old lying on my back in a futon at three in the morning when the ox carts of the farmers would wake us up to come collect our sewage. And my mother would come in and sing us songs about the honey wagons and the night soil. And you're three years old, and it's poop stories, and it's your mom singing you songs. And I thought that the cities and the farms were all one organism, and I still do. My childhood summers, until I was a teenager, were spent in the Puget Sound. My grandfather had been a lumberjack. He cut down a cedar that was 12 feet in diameter. And he had bought old growth forest when he retired, and that's where I spent my summers, catching oysters and trout and salmon playing in the woods with the giant trees. So I would move to Hong Kong after that, and I lived in a place with six million refugees with no water. We had water every fourth day for four hours, and then I would be in a world of abundance in the Puget Sound, and back and forth. And I realized that watching all this, that design is actually a signal of human intention and that in order to do our work as designers, first we must change the way we see. When someone tells me, oh, my backyard is turning into a mess, I have weeds everywhere, we might say, well, wait a minute, what if you were a butterfly? It's looking better and better every day. Then we change the way we speak. These are nutrients. These are beautiful things. Nature has a very difficult time being ugly. Have you ever noticed that? Put a child on a beach full of pebbles and they will immediately start picking their favorites. And they're all beautiful. Go to a gravel quarry, take off your shoes. Good luck. Nature has a very tough time finding ugly. Humans don't. So I'd like to tell some stories. One of my favorites is about humans and nature, or a set of my favorites, are about humans in the natural world. And Gregory Bateson wrote a book when I was just entering college called Mind and Nature. He was Margaret Mead's husband, anthropologist. And in this book, he's in the future, and he's working with the term cybernetics that Norbert Wiener had um, coined at MIT. And you've got to remember, this is when we're punching holes in cards and calling it computing. And in this book, he's in the future, and he's sitting in front of a computer. He's telling his daughter this story in the future. And he sits in front of a computer, and he says, tell me, computer, when do you think computers will begin to think like humans? And there's a long pause, and the computer says, hmm, that reminds me of a story. A story, Emerson in 1831, after his wife died, went to Europe for the first time on a sailboat. He returned in a steamship. This is the cusp of the first industrial revolution. And what is this design? Let's think about this for a minute. Because what is leadership and who is the leader on a ship? Well, obviously it's the designer of the ship because you could be the best captain in the world. But if the ship and the vessel is not seaworthy, you're going down. So he went over on a solar-powered, recyclable craft operated by craftspeople practicing ancient arts in the open air and returned in a steel rust bucket putting smoke into the air, oil on the water, operated by people working in the darkness, shoveling fossil fuels in the mouths of boilers. This is design. 
What is our intention? So seven years later, Harvard commissioned Emerson to write an, a lecture, which he delivered, and quite an astonishing essay. And the question was this. If human beings are natural, are therefore all things made by humans part of nature? And his conclusion is that nature is all the unchangeable essences, he called them. The oceans, the mountains, the leaves, the air. So much for the 19th century. Can we affect the oceans? Acidification, plastics, temperature. The mountains, we can take them down. The air, at this point in history, carbon after millennia of being an asset in soil has become a liability in the atmosphere. This is a new era. It is called the Anthropocene. It is the era of humans affecting the planet. This is the legacy of our industrial design and our systems that we enjoy. Now, I've come here from Charlottesville, Virginia, where I had the privilege of being the dean at the School of Architecture from 1994 to 1999, and lived in a house designed by Thomas Jefferson. When you live in a house designed by Jefferson and you read what he wrote, you discover quite, something quite interesting. Clearly, Thomas Jefferson thought of himself first as a designer. And as an architect, he was my architect. And if you don't understand that, all you have to do is go look at his last design, which was his tombstone near Monticello, two miles away, and you would realize on it, he only recorded the things he designed. It says, Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence, author of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom, which became the Bill of Rights, and father of the University of Virginia, the first public institution of higher learning in the world. Notice, is there anything missing? Can you imagine having been president of the United States twice and it's not important enough to put on your tombstone? What you realize, he's only recording his legacies, not his jobs, not his activities. He is recording what he left behind and just in case anybody wants to do some math, most of us in this room are Thomas Jefferson's seventh generation. Now, when we look at the University of Virginia, what he called an academical village, we realize that he's pulling together the most astonishing perspective of human values and human value in the context of the natural world. At the head of the lawn is the rotunda. It is a platonic combination of sphere and cube. It is the egg. It is the mother. It is the arts. It's Plato. It's finding truth through beauty, through culture, through love. The plans on the first two floors is a circle, and the rooms are ovals with an hourglass hall. These are ovaries. The symbols are overt. It is clear. This is mom. And the dome with its illumination for the library is this where the celestial opportunity for illumination will be. And then you look at either side, and there are these two great colonnades running down the lawn toward the south. And on either side are five pavilions. There are ten of them. This is decimal. This is number. This is Aristotle. This is the search for truth through science and number. Now what you realize that he's done is leave all this open at the south to the Blue Ridge Mountains because nature is the context in which we explore our search for truth. In 1904, a very famous architectural firm built a building at the south end and blocked it up. Welcome to the 1900s. So we realize that what he's doing is he's saying first we explore our values what do we love? What do we believe in? So in my design work, 
ever since I was a baby, my question is really quite simple because I got to spend lots of time with people and lots of time in the woods. My question is this, how do we love all of the children of all species for all time? That is the question. That is our values and that is the values of this organization. We, from there we move to our principles and I wrote something called the Hanover Principles for the German government as design principles as a gift for the Earth Summit in 1992. And from there we move to our visions and clearly I'm acting in the real world, I build things. So we know that visions without execution are hallucination. And then we have our goals, and then we have our strategies, then we have our tactics, then we measure, and then we see our value creation. And notice at the end, we do the counting. Because if you start with number, if you start with value, you can only be more efficient, you benchmark. And you end up telling the world that you want to reduce your carbon by 20% by 2020. And you're telling the kids, here's my goal, it is zero. My goal is zero. Is that what you want to tell your children? Our goal is nothing. And it makes it hard for me to achieve my goal because you are here and I have to feed you. Is this our message to these kids? And if all we're going to tell the world is what we don't want to be, and what we don't want to do, that would be like me leaving here tonight, jumping in a taxi and saying, quick, I am not going to the airport. So, being less bad is not being good. It is being bad, just less so. These are not numbers, two negative numbers multiplying into a positive. That less bad is a relationship and a human value. So what we know is that scientists and engineers, and we do a lot of engineering and science, we know more and more about less and less until we know absolutely everything about absolutely nothing. And architects, we know less and less about more and more until we know absolutely nothing about everything. So somewhere in there is ordinary life. And so what we find is that if we start with our values, we will drive to value. But if you start with value, you can drive to a benchmark. So, what is the question of legacy? Jefferson, in 1789, wrote a letter to James Madison. They were trying to design the federal government's ability to borrow money, the federal bond. And they decided the term should be one generation. And in the letter, this was Jefferson's logic. Listen to this. He said, the earth belongs to the living the earth belongs to the living. No man may by natural right, natural right, oblige the lands he owns or occupies to debts greater than those that may be paid during his own lifetime. Because if he could, the world would belong to the dead and not to the living. Hmm. What we realize here in the 1700s these folks, as well as those in France and so on, on the western side of the equation, were looking at the question of human rights. And where did that come from? It came from natural philosophy and the study of natural rights is what they called it. See, no man may by natural right. And it morphed into human rights and it became equity. And what were they doing? They were looking for the notion of fairness. And this was the destruction of primogenitor, divine right, and feudalism. Does anybody here want to go back to being a serf? In 1776, Adam Smith wrote, Smith wrote <clears throat> um, The Wealth of Nations. And same year, quite interesting. And the 1800s if, come as the economy century. If the 1700s were the equity century, the 1800s are the economy century. And all of a sudden, we have markets. And guess what? It's the destruction of feudalism primogenitor and divine right. And we get communism, we get capitalism, trying to deal with markets. We develop political systems and so on, but the markets start to control. And then we get the 1900s and the, dis the, dis the uh, discovery of, of large sources of fossil fuel. So what do we call the 1900s? All I can figure out is the pollution century. Quite a terrifying thing, really. 
And the motto appears to be that if brute force isn't working, you're not using enough of it. And in mid-century, I, as a small child, became aware of Hiroshima. And I wondered, why would people blow each other off the face of the earth, Daddy? And then I also wondered, how is it possible a city can disappear in seconds? Destruction is quick. Building is slow. And I think in mid-century when we started asking young children in this country at the age of 10 to dive under their desks to practice because the world could end in a flash, we as a culture began to live as if there might be no tomorrow. And we started to party up. So perhaps we could think again about what it means to live with a tomorrow. And perhaps this century can be the ecological century. And we could come to grips with these things. And I think we need a little bit of child supervision for the adults. So I now design everything for 10-year-olds. They understand just about everything. And they don't know about a lot of the bad people. And you'd be amazed what happens when you do this. And they understand completely, like my grandparents did, who composted and so on, that we can now t retake, remake, and restore the world instead of take, make, waste. Because with cradle to grave or cradle to crematorium, we are destroying our home. So we are now proposing a circular economy based on cradle to cradle, and I've had the privilege of being invited by the World Economic Forum to be the chair of the Meta Council on the circular economy. This puts the re back into resources. Now, how does this play out in architecture, for example? The Ford River Rouge, a great commission by Bill Ford. We ended up putting green roofs and habitats for hundreds of species on a site that was a former uh, brownfield of serious dimension. We saved Ford $35 million the first day in CapEx using this instead of chemical plants. And as I told the board for approval, when we walked in, I had a minute and a half. And we said, it's quite simple. We're going to save you $35 million in CapEx by creating habitats. And with the Ford Taurus at a 4% margin coming out of Chicago, this is the equivalent of me walking in here and giving you an order for $900 million worth of cars. Approved. NASA asked me to work on the Mars Space Station. I said, what if we come back to the Earth first? What if we come back to the blue one? What if we took the same team that did the space station and designed a space station on Earth? So we met in Houston in the room where they heard the words, Houston, we have a problem. And I opened our design section by asking a question, which was, here on Earth we say you don't need to be a rocket scientist to do something really smart, but what if you were? Who powered this thing? We did. Oh, yeah. Is that, you've figured out this is nuclear power, the reactor is 93 million miles away, safe distance, and it's eight minutes, and it's wireless. Is that the idea? Yep. We invented photovoltaic. Good. You're in charge of energy. How about the water? Can we drink our urine here? Sure. Any yuck factor? Are you kidding? It's $80,000 to get a gallon of water up here. Sure we do. How are we doing on, on down here on the, on the in the terrosphere, folks. San Diego and Sydney tried to work with their extreme droughts and recover sewage water. They failed. Singapore did, uh, tried to recover theirs. They succeeded. Words matter. The initiatives in San Diego and Sydney were called toilet to tap. Oops. Singapore was new water. Could somebody get out the marking department? So we designed a building in Mountain View, California that can make 120% more power than it requires and give it to its neighbors and purify its own water down to the molecule. And we built it for a normal federal front office building ahead of schedule. Bring in the rocket scientists. So finally, a building I'm working on now that I'm very excited about is in Barcelona. And the decoration for the lobby is two sheets of glass two feet apart in their shelves. 
And what you will see as you go to work for decoration is chrysalis of butterflies on the shelves, and the walls will just be hatching the ancient butterflies of Barcelona that are going extinct. It is our decoration. And on the weekends, the children will come and open the outside windows and release the ancient butterflies back into Barcelona. And then they will go pester the parks department, the highway department. They are our marketing program. Bring them on. So let us change the way we see. Let us change the way we speak. Let us speak in the present of the future perfect. Let us speak of the future perfect in the present tense. So I have a proposal. We've heard about the monarchs. Words matter. I propose we walk out of here tonight and somebody quietly go over to the White House and recommend to President Obama that the first thing we should do is take a look at the milkweed, the right ones, not the wrong ones, carefully study the monarch migrations, which we have, and declare the milkweed not a weed. Who wants a weed? Toilet to tap. We kill weeds. We have big companies that spend huge amounts of money killing weeds. We have centuries of killing weeds. Why would we think of something as precious as this thing that lets us have this beautiful butterfly and call it a weed? I think we should rename the milkweed the monarch flower and make it a national flower. Thank you very much. Thank you.